talk about this. Let's talk about this. So, this is an interview courtesy of the one and only Throwing Fits podcast. And they featured this girl called Brenda Hashtag, who is now going by Brenda Weisher. Weisher, Weisher, please forgive me for lack of pronunciation. A lady from Germany, obviously, specifically from Berlin, who is a little bit of an influencer style icon over there on the social media platforms and stuff. I kind of found her randomly, I think on Instagram, because I remember just seeing, oh, who's this girl that's always wearing all black? That looks like an absolute ghost and stuff. Like, why go on for this? She's even got this really funny picture of her wardrobe in her house. And it's just like a massive rail. And one side is black and one side is white. That's all she wears. It's pretty crazy. So um, I checked her out and stuff and saw her, you know, because it's kind of surprising to see like somebody from Berlin who's actually got legit style and doesn't just look like they shop you know 100 in flipping flea markets or they look like they don't live in a fucking ashtray or they don't look like they live in an apartment where they sleep on a pallet they carry on a copy of like the gay science they've never finished you know <laughs> they kind of rant and rave about postmodernism. um they ruin the vibe at the afters by flipping putting on some fucking lecture and some in the middle of you flipping racking up lines you know that kind of person right zero swag zero style but she obviously stood out a little bit because she actually dresses pretty nicely and actually wears luxury brands and clearly wears them buys them sells them styles them and shit so it's pretty cool to see anyway she can be a little bit annoying she's got a little a little things that's kind of annoying one thing being that she does not waste an opportunity to tell you she went to st martin's i went to central st martin's right i studied at you know central st martin's this illustrious design school here in london i did product design i'm very good at doing that sort of thing i haven't obviously you know taken it up as a career clearly hence why i'm talking to you through a fucking iphone <laughs> but you know it's, it is what it is you go to the university it's cool it's sick but after a while especially in your adult age it's not really something to kind of flex on too much because you're kind of creating your own history by the work that you're doing in real time no one really cares what college you went to really for the sake of it i could have learned that shit in open university i could have learned that shit you know via youtube and it would have been the same results really and truly even though not really because i probably didn't put my best attitude forward when i was doing the course uh, when i went there especially when i was doing product design at st martin's all of the students most of the students in my class were from Asia, everyone from like South Korea who was working at fucking Samsung and shit went to university. So again, these people were like in the mid twenties at the time. They went back to uni to get extra qualifications. Imagine that. I was fresh out of college, 18 years old. I didn't even take a foundation to go into St. Martin's. I went straight in for my sixth form with my graphic design folder and got into the flipping degree course. And then I'm competing, quote unquote, in the same class as like guys and women with children and shit who worked for Samsung back at South Korea or like a design studio back there or in Japan and shit. And then now kind of working alongside me when doing the same brief so when i'm kind of presenting my shitty sketches with my hairy lines and they have these amazing draft drawings that come from books and shit that look like they've been flipping done in cad but it's all from freehand i'm standing there thinking <laughs> so my central st. martin's experience wasn't the greatest so when i hear somebody you know bragging about central st. martin's all the time especially somebody who's achieved as much as this girl has in the short space of time on social media it's a little bit weird but to be honest as well a little bit of self-reflection part of the reason why she is successful especially in her field way more than i am is because she's able to do that self-marketing self-speak right they're like your little five minute elevator pitch thing i've got uh you know what she, what she got she's got like um an archived store where you sell you know um luxury brands and stuff and collections and pieces from yesteryears i have this popping instagram creative consultant i'm not an influencer i'm not a stylist all these type of things that like you gotta have these pictures that you throw out so Andrew St. martin's blah 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 and obviously the aesthetic is definitely striking you'd notice that from afar so as much as i can rag on her for like mentioning st martin's way too often i also feel like she's definitely clued on and definitely a smart girl anyway long story less long she had an interview with throwing fits where she dropped a couple of gems and these are the clips that they posted on their socials regarding them and i'm going to play them back to back one clip here features why she got banned from flipping soho house in berlin and i know this story because i featured it in my podcast and it was regarding bottega veneta doing a uh, con you know a, a collection showcase in Berghain during the height of the pandemic and flying over all these celebrities to do it having a big party having virgil dj you know whilst everyone was locked down it was really bad optics but um brenda hashtag gives a bit of background as to what went on and the fact that she was maybe one of the people that kind of led to the overall cancellation of Daniel Lee eventually when you got the boot from uh, Bottega Veneta or if you believe the PR story that he left but this is Brenda Wesher hashtag on throwing fits talking about it do you know my Bottega scandal 
No, no, tell us. Oh my god, I'm kicked out of Soul House for that. Daniel Lee Bottega, they flew to Berlin to shoot their show in Berghain. It was full lockdown. I started posting about it and then it took off and it was in the national news. It becomes a whole scandal and it was kind of part of the downfall of Daniel Lee at Bottega. This is so dark, but for example, at LVMH, after John Galliano's scandal, just put lightly, and Alexander McQueen's death, I think they're trying a lot harder to control in a positive way their creative directors that they don't uh, go on cog benders or that they have security i think at lvmh these things will not happen anymore creative directors like driven crazy by the amount of work the pressure the whatever and at caring i think daniel lee was is one of the reasons why maybe they are also and then balenciaga obviously we working how the creative directors work how much pressure is on them yeah. how much are they allowed to say how much they are allowed to go off the rails you know i think so that will break their minds yeah. but the funny thing about this is interesting story so she says she broke the story about daniel lee doing the flipping you know showcase and collection thing in berlin during the height of the pandemic the funny thing for me i think about this whole idea behind these big fashion groups lvmh caring deciding to rein in their creative directors they're the ones that give the creative directors the free reign they kind of enjoy the chaos and the madness because usually it kind of impacts their bottom line usually the mavericks and the psychos and stuff it kind of adds to the allure of the brand i think so anyway it does for me because i feel like they're a lot more like they're a lot more human they have a personality behind it they're not just kind of robots that just kind of do the brand design and go home and kind of rinse and repeat they live a life and they're sort of like imbued and ingrained in the clothes that they flip and design so it's really funny in that you know daniel lee goes all to the trouble of having his collection shown at Bergheim. Then I think the last collection before he left, he showed it in Detroit because he loves techno and shit. All these places where he went to party and the excuse to probably get fucked up and shit. He did it all under the watch and approval of Kering. Then when it goes badly and the public react, you know, don't react well to it, Kering suddenly pushes him to the front and kind of puts their hands up and says, nothing we could do. It wasn't our fault. It's just him. He's loose. He does what he wants. No, you approve it. You give him the flipping company card. You approve all the flipping, you know, dance and models being sent over makeup artists all that malarkey kind of you know absolve yourself of blame when it gets a bit sticky is a little bit gross but i also do remember this is a the, the funky thing about it is that during this time when this event happened i remember kind of virgil getting a lot of stick because if i'm not mistaken virgil ablo r.i.p to the go and you know god bless the dead he was if i'm not mistaken the dj at the event so they host this um showcase but they hosted it in Berkhan, if i'm not mistaken and then the after party took place at the berlin soho house and um you know they flew people over obviously in screen you could see skepta there and they had also virgil djing there the really sad thing about virgil djing there is that number one i think it was one of the best outfits that virgil's ever worn going to one of these events legit i'm trying to see it here on the flipping rub through but it wants it must be one of the best and most iconic virgil ablo outfits that he had on when he went to the flipping bird kind to do the flipping show let me take the sound off actually let me just replay it one more time pretty sure there's a picture here of virgil walking to the show it's one of the most iconic this one this look here with the jersey and the hat and stuff and the glasses and the jacket and the big turquoise pants like this look is absolutely banging for my american listeners or viewers of a live stream do you know what team that is jersey is wearing i have no idea what hockey team team or whatever team he's wearing there that jersey looks incredible the really sad thing about this bit of sweet is that we thought this look was amazing i did anyway but if you look at it the fact that he's concealing his hair and his face and stuff most of the reason why is because this was when he was in the throngs of his chemotherapy but we didn't know at the time because he kept it completely secret and obviously him and his family only knew and his close friends but he didn't reveal it to anybody so the entire time that he was getting cancelled number one for the george floyd protests and stuff and the donations that he was making and the fact that people didn't think it was enough i think he got cancelled also because i think he made some comment about the riots and the looting and then people were trying to cancel him because he attended the show he went and attended the show during the height of the pandemic he went and dj'd at the after party and you know little did we know he was flipping battling cancer and actually going through chemo hence why he was covered up the way he was he covered up his face covered up his hair and all that malarkey so r.i.p virgil god bless the dead because i feel like the daniel lee story the funny thing about it is that the fact that this alleged story of him allegedly calling some black woman or black person in the meeting black cunt or whatever he called them is definitely kind of swept under the rug and people have more smoke that he did the pandemic shit says everything about the pandemic hysteria COVID-19 broke all of our brains to the point where people are more offended that you hosted the party during the flipping you know the peak season of the pandemic and lockdown than of you potentially being racist <laughs> racism can just chill oh my god you're not wearing a mask oh my god where's your vaccination card oh my god you're doing a party during lockdown die 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 it's like come on guys man 
He allegedly called somebody a black cunt in the studio. And then he went away, came back, and he's got a job at Burberry. What the fuck is that about? That sounds about white to me, innit? That sounds about white to me, mate. That sounds about white. Anyway, next clip here featuring Brenda, hashtag Brenda Washer, is this one, courtesy of Throwing Fits, where she talks about the most interesting subject and something that's a bit complex and a little bit nuanced and stuff concerning the scene and concerning the fashion industry and in general is what happens at night. We all know, if you're part of the scene and whatnot, you know, unfortunately, being involved in it and going to, you know, going to collection releases, going to private views, going to after parties, going to fashion shows, going to panel discussions, going to store openings, going to these things in person and hanging out and just being a good vibe and making friends and networking can really get you a long way. Sometimes get you further in your career than actually being good at what you do. Sometimes focusing on just being a cool person to hang out with. Bonus points if you know where to get the drugs. Bonus points if you've got the link for all the best spots in terms of guest lists. Bonus points if you can always get a table at the best restaurants. Bonus points if you can get mates race at hotels. All this stuff can actually help you get further in these kind of avenues and these sort of fields than actually being good at a craft, being good at your job. It's sad, but it's true. So if that's the case, you have to play the game to kind of favor you. And I like what Brenda said here because effectively she's straightish from what it sounds like. She doesn't drink, doesn't do drugs for the most part, doesn't really party. Yet she's been able to ascend to this lofty position in fashion, mostly from building her own platform, having her own audience and then leveraging that. She's gone from being a little bit of an influencer, social media star, to then going and doing some contributing with 032C, the amazing magazine which I have many of over here. Look how many 032 Cs I have. Look at that. One, eh? Two, three, two, C. Three, three, two, C. Four, three, two, C. Many, many, many. So she's now the, you know, the, I think fashion director of that magazine. So it's a great position. So the need to go out and party and do that whole druggy thing is completely gone. So this is a message regarding it. Curse of throwing fits. Person in fashion to party with. I'm in bed by 10 p.m. I also, I really, I don't do drugs and most people do. So at some point you have nothing to talk about with people. Because they're pitching you on so many good business ideas. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is also very overworked people who are expected by their bosses mm -hmm. to still be socializing and out at 11 p.m. No, sure. I don't have to do that. People suck up to me my influencing studies now maybe this but these are very hardworking people i'm not excusing drug abuse again but i understand where this comes from because yeah. they don't work nine hours this is like an endless cycle and fashion deals are made at 2 a.m this is how it it's super yeah. toxic there's but no they work life balance at all at all yeah. and the worst also collabs <laughs> are born at 2 a.m in a bathroom <laughs> no <small>. fully <laughs> but this is where it happens doing fendi gucci <laughs> No, but this is how it happens. And there's also no HR for most people. If you're freelance, any stylist, any yeah. producer, any anyone, if you're being abused, you have no one to talk to. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, good point from her. And I do love, I love the point that she made, specifically the point around, I don't have to do that anymore now because people suck up to me. I think that's the major thing. And I think for me, that I think has been the key difference to this newer generation of kids coming up. I feel like the kids coming up nowadays are not really enamored about working for an illustrious company, working for an ID, working for an arena home, working for a Days, working for a 032C. They're not, they don't care working for a, you know, Condé Nast. Most of these kids, I feel like want to build their own platform and leverage their fame and their attention with these platforms and then kind of get the best of both worlds so that you can have the job and the kind of clout and the sort of prestige that comes from working with a Vogue but you've got your own thing going on so that if Vogue say hey fuck off we don't need you anymore we're all set on our diversity hires no more affirmative action black people go outside right after all the BLM things are over and they send you back out on the streets at least you've got your Instagram at least you've got your social media to keep popping and doing that type of thing so I feel like that's the thing that a lot of these kids are inherently doing which i like and also think about it from from a point of view of securing the bag you're always going to be in a strong position because you're operating from a point of like you're working with them as a collaborator as a freelancer as a contractor as opposed to an employee so you come in with a bit more clout they're gonna have to order the fucking the pret-a-manger platter for you they're gonna have to take your dietary concerns into consideration they have to order an uber x to pick you up and shit they're gonna do all that shit and treat you like a star because you are but if you're just an employee you have to get there yourself. You're lugging all the equipment there yourself. You have to spend loads of money out of pocket. You have to invoice all your expenses and then get paid it back in six months. 
it's a terror. So at least when you're approaching it from a point of view of like, no, I'm actually, I'm actually that person. I'm actually that girl. I can hold my position. I've got my platform. You know why you're coming to me. I can get the views because I'd imagine that column that she's got for zero three two c it's quite easy to say, hey, this is what I'm bringing to your platform. This is my column. I interview all these amazing people. The Rick Owens, you know, article probably is doing numbers. You can see the click-through rate, the read rate, blah, blah, blah. And you can say, hey, since I've joined your company, I've kind of added this amount of views to your platform. Back up the fucking bring truck. Give me the bags. Give me the euros. And let me keep going. I feel like a lot of people, probably similar to her, who are very social media, you know, um, native and kind of want to present a certain image about themselves, they probably care about that too much. But I feel like she's got a good balance. She kind of does the whole social media thing, but also clearly works um, very hard in the background um, to do her job. And clearly, if you're sleeping at 10 p.m. every day, you can get a good eight hours in, wake up in the morning, do what needs to be done, answer your emails like a good, you know, influencer does. Take a dog on a walk and, you know, style some bits and bobs and do what needs to be do with a fresh mind, as opposed to get it out of your brain like I would be. So that's great to see. So, yeah, she seems really cool seems really great check out the interview i haven't listened to it in full i'm only about halfway through at the moment but it's up on throwing fits you can find it wherever you find podcasts they've also got a patron so support them on that regard and the interview some cool interesting people within the fashion space 